Welcome to the second um, Quantum Portugal Initiative lecture. We have with us Pablo Jarillo uh, Herrero. Um, and uh, uh, to host this session, we have with us uh, one of the members of the organizing committee of this uh, Quantum Lectures, Joaquin Rossier. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the second Quantum Portugal Initiative lecture. I'm going to be telling this session, okay? So uh, it is a great honor uh, to have um, MIT professor Pablo Jarillo uh, here with us today. Uh, well, at least virtually, because I guess, Pablo, you are in, in Boston, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so let me, let me say, tell you a few words about, uh, about Pablo, Pablo's uh, trajectory, okay? So he obtained his um, bachelor degree in Valencia uh, on 99, if I'm not mistaken. And, and then he moved to uh, uh, UC San Diego in, in, in California uh, to get his master. Actually, that's where we met. So it has been a long time, right? Um, and after that, he, he, he flew back to Europe to get his uh, PhD in the Technical University of Delft. He spent there a few years and he got his PhD in 2005, uh, working on quantum transport in nanotubes and also adding on, on graphene. He published uh, four papers as first author in Nature, which sets the bar of what a very good PhD uh, is now. And, um, and then he moved uh, uh, to the postdoc in, in Columbia, New York. So again, uh, uh, in the US. And, and after that, he, he obtained a position in, uh, assistant professor position in MIT, where he has been ever since, and where he's now um, a full professor. So Paul is an experimental physicist uh, with several groundbreaking contributions in the area of, of 2D materials. And I'm not using the word groundbreaking lightly. The discovery of, of um, superconductivity in two-step layer graphene in the group of Pablo is gonna uh, uh, make the books of, of uh, material science and chemistry change uh, because they need to include carbon as another elemental material that goes superconducting. And more importantly, this has created a new research field that is keeping busy most of the best group in condensed matter and material science on the world trying to understand um, the electronic properties of twisted bilayer and, and other types of twisted structures that actually we're going to hear on this talk. So um, and for this reason, Pablo has received uh, several recognitions, including the World uh, Prize and the APS Bagley Medal. And, um, and the, with this, let me uh, finish the introduction. Uh, I don't know if we should wait one minute or I give you the floor. So I see that we have seven, 67 participants, so that should be enough to get started. Um, so that's it, Pablo. Thanks a lot for, for, uh, for, the, for accepting the invitation. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, Joaquin, uh, for the invitation. And and, and um, you know, I, I just wish I could be there at INL. You know, I'm sure the weather now in in Braga must be super uh, super nice, and uh, you know, with spring and full of flowers and, and great. And I hope all of you and your families are are well. And yeah, you know, I hope we can meet again in person soon. So um, thank you very much again for the invitation. As as Joaquin mentioned. Um, you know, this is uh, this this research, you know, on on twisted ballet graphene, and more generically, more quantum matter is something which is relatively recent, and that is, uh, I think, it's uh, attracting a lot of uh, attention. And, and you know, I hope to convince you that there are good reasons for that. So I'm going to tell you about you know this this magic of more quantum matter, but you know, because this is a generic lecture, a general lecture. Let me uh, start with a little bit more of a you know, background, uh, high level introduction. Okay? And, you know, one, one thing that is very pervasive in physics is the, the fact that there are, you know, some of the most fascinating states of matter that we have are states where interactions among the individual constituents that make that matter are very strong, okay? So the strongly correlated states of matter appear in many areas of physics. So for example, the quark gluon plasma, which is a state of matter that occurs a few hundreds of nanoseconds after the Big Bang that we can recreate nowadays in heavy ion you know, uh, colliders, such as Brookhaven. The different phases of nuclear matter in neutron stars 
are also strongly correlated. Okay, this is a picture from the Chandra X-ray Observatory of the neutron star. And if you go to Wikipedia, you can see that these different phases are called nuclear pasta. Okay, and they are all strongly correlated. And you know, closer to to to, to my heart, you know, are the different topological states of matter. For example, if you take a two-dimensional electron gas and you subject it to a perpendicular magnetic field, then you can enter the fractional quantum hole regime where, you know, due to strong interaction between the electrons, very unusual types of behavior, for example, fractionalized, you know, charges and, and topological excitations can occur. Now, we zoom in a bit more into the field of strongly correlated quantum materials, you know, this describes, you know, these are large classes, you know, large families of materials. Perhaps the most studied of all is the family of high temperature, you know, cuprate superconductors, where in a phase diagram of temperature versus doping, we have a variety of phases, you know, few of which we have a very good understanding of, even until, you know, even to this day, despite decades and decades of research. Now, strongly interactive systems are hard to solve theoretically. Okay, so for example, if you take the, the you know elemental you know the, the essence of the high temperature cuprate superconductors you know all the action takes place in these copper oxygen planes where you have in the stoichiometric compound you have one electron per copper atom so one electron per site okay and now this due to very strong coulomb repulsion between your electrons these electrons are stuck in their positions so the you know this system is a correlated mode insulator and now an interesting dynamics happens when you remove a few of these electrons. So when you dope with holes, now electrons can jump from you know, occupied sites to empty sites. And then the system, you know, but they have to do that in a correlated fashion, maybe the other places are occupied. And this forms a you know, superconductor, okay? Now, the essence of this physics is believed to be described by the Hubbard model. Okay, which tells you about you know this penalty u you know, en you know energy penalty u to occupy a site with two electrons, and it also allows you to hop between electrons with this, you know hopping t. But now I say that it is believed to be described because we cannot actually solve this Hubbard model you know exactly analytically okay for large numbers of electrons, so we do not know yet exactly how to do the mapping between this and you know this type of phase diagrams. Okay. Now, in terms of investigating quantum materials, you know, tradition and strongly correlated physics, traditionally we have had two platforms. One is, you know, many, many decades old, is the actual quantum materials with typical lattice scales of a few angstroms. The other one, more recent, about 20 years ago, people started to investigate ultra cold atoms in optical lattices where you can tune the interaction between your atoms, you know. That length scale, the separation between those atoms is about a micron, okay? And what I wanna tell you about today is about more quantum matter. It's a new platform to investigate strongly correlated and topological physics, where the natural length scale, the Morel length is of order 10 nanometers, okay? Now associated with these length scales are temperature or energy scales. In typical quantum materials, you, your energy scale is of order 100 to 1000 Kelvin. In cold atoms, it's 0.1 to 1 nano Kelvin. And in um, more quantum matter, because the length scale is intermediate between these other two length scales, the temperature scale is also intermediate, you know, 1 to 10, maybe 1 to 100 Kelvin. Yeah. So the thing that has enabled these new platforms, more quantum matter, is the fact that with two two dimensional materials, we can do the following we can rotate one with respect to another and create a more pattern, okay? <laughs> this thing, which is sometimes also called twistronics, okay? But it's even more general because you can do this with two different materials and then you don't need to twist angle. But the fact that we can, you know, create these arbitrary, you know, combinations of materials and twist the relative twist angle, that's something which is unprecedented in the history of material science and that we're only able to do with the advent of 2D materials, okay? so. With this, let me tell you, uh, you know, with this introduction, let me tell you the outline of my talk. I'm going to describe first magic angle graphene and you know, graphene, magic angle graphene, and more generically, more equal to matter, what happened since our discovery. Then I will focus on the next generation more quantum matter, called it more magic 3.0. In particular, a new system called magic angle 
twisted trilayer graphene, which is a very highly tunable superconductor. It realizes ultra strong coupling superconductivity. And I'll tell you about an unexpected surprise related to the spin properties of the system. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some of the outlook in, in this field. So let me start with, with graphene, okay? So graphene is a honeycomb of carbon atoms. Yeah? All of these atoms are chemically identical, so chemically equivalent, they're all carbon. But from the crystallographic point of view, these are non-equivalent, okay? It turns out in order to tile a honeycomb into dimensions, you need two atoms in addition to two unit vectors, okay? And we call these atoms, the, you know, these sublattices, the A and B sublattices, or the red and green atoms in this plot. Now, you can calculate the electronic you know, in a simple quantum mechanical model, you can calculate the electronic structure for electrons in graphene, energy versus momentum in the X and Y direction, okay? And this is a very unusual electronic structure where near charge neutrality, near the Fermi energy of charge neutrality, you have these double cones, which are you know, known as Dirac cones, okay? So graph electrons in graphene have this unusual energy momentum dispersion, it's linear. Okay, as opposed to quadratic for most electrons in materials. Okay, this linear energy momentum dispersion is more characteristic of systems, you know, of, of particles like photons. Okay, so in fact, if you, you know, formalize this dispersion into a Hamiltonian equation, you know, what you get is the Dirac equation in two dimensions for massless particles. Okay, so energy is proportional to momentum. Sigma is the Pauli matrix, and this thing, this spinner. Okay here, which in the usual Dirac equation tells you whether the electron has spin up or spin down. In the um, case of graphene, this is a pseudo spin, which tells you whether the electron wave function is on the A type of atom or on the B type of atom, yeah? Now, this is, I think this is pretty much the only equation or maybe one more equation I'm gonna have in the entire talks, don't worry. The only other thing that I want you to, to remember is that there happen to be two sets of this inequivalent, you know, Dirac cones, they're called the K and the K prime values. So electrons in graphene, we say that they have this fourfold degeneracy, spin up and spin down, valley K, valley K prime. Just remember number four, because it will appear later in my talk. Okay. Now, what happens when you put graphene on top of graphene and you rotate? Okay. So a moiré pattern forms where the moiré wavelength, the, the you know, distance between the soccer balls that you see in the screen is you know, dependent on the twist angle. And in particular, it can go all the way to infinity if you go closer and closer to zero degrees, okay? So now this is what happens in real space. Let's look now at what happens to the electronic structure, you know, and in, in momentum space. So let's imagine that we start with two graphene sheets which are already rotated by a relatively small angle, okay? In that case, we have the Dirac cone, you know, of the electrons in one graphene sheet and the Dirac cones of the electrons in the other graphene sheet, they you know, are separated in momentum space, okay? And the separation in momentum space for small angles is proportional to the twist angle theta, okay? The system was studied by many, many people before, okay? Now, this could be the situation, you know, these, these two interpenetrating energy dispersions, this could be a situation if the electrons in one graphene sheet didn't know about the other graphene sheet. However, you know, these two graphene sheets, when we place them on top of each other, they're just three Armstrongs apart, okay? So electrons are very much aware that the other graphene sheet exists, and in particular, they can tunnel between the two graphene sheets. So this interlayer tunneling leads to bonding, anti-bonding states, you know, similar to bonding, anti-bonding states in a hydrogen molecule, but now in a giant graphene molecule, okay? So it leads to splitting, okay? Here, where you have a bonding state at lower energy and an anti-bonding band at higher energy, okay? So this gap due to interlayer tunneling, this is the situation that is realized when this gap is small compared to the energy of that crossing point, which is given by this, okay? Now, if you now twist towards smaller and smaller angle, this bonding band gets pushed down towards smaller and smaller energy until it reaches zero, okay? Then we say that the flat band has been realized and the flat band condition is reached at the magic angle, okay? Which for graphene on top of graphene happens to be 1.1 degrees. 
So this is something that was, you know, it was theoretical work uh, by Mr. Sarah McDonald, you know, a little bit earlier also theoretical work by Suarez Morel and also experimental work by the group of Ivan Dre, you know, where they saw that indeed, you know, interesting single particle physics, you know, happens at that 1.1 degrees, okay? Now, this is, you know, the thing that I showed you before was a, a cartoon. Let me show you an actual calculation. This is the energy versus momentum for magic angle graphene. You see there's a set here of flat bands. It's not 100% flat, okay? But it is much, much, the dispersion here is much, much flatter than the original graphene dispersion, okay? And these are the bands that are called the remote bands. You know, they're the next set of more mini bands. Now, how should we picture electrons in these flat bands, okay? So, you know, where in particular do the electrons like to sit when you place them on these flat bands? So for that, we have to go from momentum space back to real space. And remember, in order to go from momentum space to real space, you have to do a Fourier transform, okay? So flat in momentum space means highly localized in real space. So if you, play the, if you place electrons in these flat bands, then these electrons, they like to sit in certain regions in your Moray pattern, okay? And in particular, they like to sit in regions where locally the stacking between these two graphene sheets is AA type. So where locally all of the carbon atoms in one layer are on top of the carbon atoms on the other layer. Now, these regions are tunnel coupled, okay? In, by regions where the electrons do not like to sit. And those regions are regions of local AB stacking, where due to the small twist angle, the registry between the carbon atoms shifts. And, you know, you know, some atoms are on top of others, others are on top of, you know, in the middle of the hexagons. And that's called AB stacking. So schematically from the top, magic angle graphene looks like this. You have a more pattern where you have these AA regions where the electrons like to sit. And these are separated by A, B, and B, A regions where the electrons do not like to sit, okay? And in a slightly more realistic picture, we have this, you know, twisted bilayer graphene. These A, A regions are separated by around 13 nanometers, okay? And this is going to form a triangular Fermi Hubbard lattice, you know, by analogy with, with the cold atoms, except that, you know, it's not truly triangular, it's actually a honeycomb because these AB and BA regions are not identical. And it's not really a standard Fermi Hubbard lattice because we have interesting topological properties of the system that, you know, prevent a real, you know, a direct mapping to an actual Hubbard lattice. Now, what my group discovered a couple of years ago is that, I mean, actually by now, three years ago, that if you take, you know, these graphene systems and you place the Fermi energy in these flat bands, okay, and you tune your Fermi energy to a given number of electrons per mole unit cell, you can find interesting correlated insulated behaviors and okay, where the conductance is zero. In regions where the system should be a good metal, the system is an insulator. And if you dope away from these regions, magic and graphene becomes a superconductor, okay? All of this behavior happens only in a relatively narrow angular range around this 1.1 degree. So it's clearly related to these flat bands, yeah? Now, magic and graphene happens to be an electrically tunable superconductor, okay? Means if you measure the resistivity versus temperature and charge density, okay? At a certain number of electrons per mole unit cell, you have a correlated insulated behavior, and then you add a few holes, you have a superconductor, you have a few electrons and you have another superconductor, okay? Now, when my students show me <clears throat> this data, they reminded me immediately of the hundreds of times that I've seen this type of phase diagrams, okay? These are the phase diagrams for high temperature couplet superconductors, okay? At zero doping, that means one electron per unit cell, the system is a both insulator. Now, let me flip this axis so that they correspond to this axis here, hole and electron doping, now it's correct. So if you add extra holes, you have a big superconducting dome. If you add electrons, you have another smaller superconducting dome, okay? Now, the difference between these two diagrams is that this is a theoretical phase diagram, okay? In order to populate this with actual data points, you have to grow hundreds of crystals of different material classes because not everything can grow electron dope or whole dope or for different doping ranges, okay? Whereas here, this entire diagram is obtained in a single device 
in a single disorder realization without the addition of chemical impurities. And I can go from here to here in a few seconds, okay? So that's something which, of course, attracted a lot of attention. Now, there are many similarities, but also many differences between these systems. Now, so we posted, you know, these results in, in March, you know, 2018. And then what I call the theory tsunami came, okay? So this is just a short list of the papers that appear within a few weeks of us posting our results, okay? A lot of papers, theory papers trying to address what is the origin of the correlated insulator states and what is the superconducting order parameter. There are all kinds of predictions, you know, with all letters of the alphabet, you know, the, the thing started with Senke Shu and Leon Balance, you know, which predicted the triangular lattice with the D plus ID chiral topological superconductor. And from then on, all kinds of things were predicted, you know, all the parameters S, P, D, S plus P plus D, F, you know, you name it. So I'm not going to comment on what the answer is. We don't know it yet. Okay. This needs, requires further investigation. Uh, but we have even, you know, uh, proposals how to get to room temperature, to room temperature, you know, using the systems, etc. I invite you to check some of these papers. Okay. Now, together with the theory tsunami, there was also quite a bit of interest from the popular press. Okay. And then, you know, more importantly, uh, interest from experimental community. Okay. So let me tell you, you know, our the actual paper, you know, the paper was published actually in April 2018, you know, we posted in March, it was published in April. Let me tell you what has happened since, since then, okay? So the first thing that has happened is that we reproduced our own results, okay? We have measured many, many more devices, okay? This is always good that when you can reproduce uh, your own results. It doesn't always happen, so it's good when it happens, okay? So since then we have, you know, many devices, you know, some of these, you know, we're starting to measure, in fact, the critical temperature at optimal doping as a function of twist angle, this is a new knob in condensed matter physics, twist angle, and we can measure now no, you know, superconducting domes in this new knob, you know, twist angle. This just appeared, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, together with other interesting physics in the system. Now, even more important than you reproducing your own results is that when when other groups, you know, reproduce completely independently your results, okay, only then this thing becomes real, real physics, real science, okay? So after our discovery, you know, there were, you know, a, you know, a number of groups that produced our results. The first one was a collaboration by the group of Corey Dina at Columbia University, Andrea Young at UC Santa Barbara. Not only they reproduced our results, they extended in an interesting direction, tuning the superconductivity with pressure. And then the group of Dimitri Efetov, uh, ICFO found, you know, in a device that you can occasionally find, you know, additional superconducting domes. By now, robust superconductivity in magic angle graphene has been reproduced and extended by many groups, okay, by over a dozen groups and more people and more groups keep joining. Now, we have discover, discovered other correlated systems. For example, magic angle twisted bilayer bilayer graphene, that was the second system we discovered. So this is one regular bilayer graphene with zero degree twist angle. Okay, this is called Bernal bilayer or AB stack bilayer. Another Bernal stack bilayer graphene. And now these pair of bilayers, we twist them on top of each other at the twist angle, at the magic angle. Okay, the system is called magic angle twisted bilayer bilayer graphene, so four layers in total. That system has interesting correlated properties, interesting magnetic behavior. It is not a superconductor though, okay? Then people also starting to do scanning probe microscopy studies, very interesting scanning, scanning tunneling microscopy studies, scanning nanosquid, scanning NCT, scanning near field optical studies, which allowed us to see microscopically how do these more patterns look like, okay? Quantify the level of disorder, the twist angle disorder, et cetera. I wanna in particular highlight one paper, okay? And, 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 and to highlight that, let me just, you know, um, tell you a little bit, uh, the summary of what we learned from our global transform measurements, yeah? So for the first year or so, uh, you know, the phase diagram of magic angle twist to you know, was entirely determined by global transport, electronic transport measurements, okay? Now, this phase diagram is schematic, it depends on the twist angle and it's evolving fast, okay? So just don't look too much at the details, just, just get a general picture. So in a temperature versus 
filling factor. So what do I mean by filling factor? By filling factor, this means charge density, but it's just normalized. So that the filling factor tells you what's the number of electrons or holes that we dope per more unit cell, okay? So remember in these flat bands, okay? We can, you know, we have, you know, the, you know, the, the spin, valley degree of freedom, and in addition, we have a layer of sublattice degree of freedom. So in these flats, we can, in these flat bands, we can put from from the bottom of this band to the top of the flat band, we can put eight electron per more, eight electrons per more unit cell. Okay, so from charge neutrality, we can put four electrons or four holes per more unit cell. Okay, from zero, you can put four electrons up or empty four electrons or put four holes down. Okay, now when you put four electrons per more unit cell or four holes per more unit cell, your chemical potential lands in the middle of these band gaps. So here you have regular band insulator, single particle band insulator behavior. Okay, now when you put an integer number of electrons per more unit cell, you have something interesting happens, okay? Typically you have either a correlated insulated behavior or a correlated semi-metal behavior, okay? And that happens at those integers. And then when we dope with electrons or holes around those, you know, particularly this is the most pronounced dome, you get superconductivity. This is the most pronounced dome. Then this is the next most pronounced dome, okay? And then here you have a little bit of superconductivity depending on the sample. So now that was all determined from global transport measurements. And then we started to gain more insight when we started to perform what is known as thermodynamic measurements, okay? So what do I mean, okay? We started, you know, there were you know, two papers then, one uh, from my own group in collaboration with the group of Shah Halilani at the Weizmann Institute, and very similar results were published by the group of Ali Yuzani at Princeton, and you know, subsequently also further work by my own group. This is actually now published in Nature a few weeks ago too, where you know, in the case of our um, experiment with Ali Lani, what we did is we were able to measure the chemical potential of the sample. Chemical potential is a thermodynamic quantity. And in particular, we measure the inverse compressibility, the derivative of the chemical potential with respect to charge density. Okay? How does the chemical potential in your system change as you add charge to the system, okay? You, in the single particle picture, you can think of this as the inverse density of states. Compressibility goes as the density of states, okay? For that, we used a scanning single electron transistor probe. So the group of Shahalidani has developed this carbon nanotube that he can place at the tip of an, you know, essentially of an, uh, of an atomic force microscope tip, similar system. And then you can scan this tip over your sample so that you can locally measure. This is a very sensitive, you know, voltmeter, and you can locally measure changes in your chemical potential, you know, as you change the charge density in your system. Okay. So we scan over a device which is large and has regions with different twist angle. We can take these, you know, inverse compressibility measurements as a function of filling factor. Okay. And what you can see is that at different twists angle, these traces, you know, differ. But you can see that, you know, between one and you know 1.2, there is a series of features, in particular a series of sawtooth behavior near each integer. Okay. So let me zoom in a bit more on that. Okay. So the inverse compressibility as a function of filling factor, you know. At four and minus four, because you have single particle insulators, you have these large peaks, okay? Because remember, this is like inverse density of states. You don't have density of states at the gap, so it diverges. A charge neutrality also diverges, and then you have this sort of behavior near each integer, okay? So the way to understand, you know, one way to understand this in a, in a very simple picture, okay? We, you know, we're now refining these pictures, but in a single, in a very simple picture, one way to understand this is that Starting from charge neutrality, when the system, you know, this, this spin and valley flavors that I mentioned before, okay, you remember this number four, you know, let's look at the occupancy of this, you know, Dirac cones, you know, spin and valley, okay, so spin up, spin down, valley K, valley K prime flavors as we add electrons to our system. So initially from charge neutrality, we start adding electrons to our system and all four flavors get populated at the same time, okay? But then when we're 
close to total filling factor one, meaning each of these flavors is one quarter occupied, okay? The system due to strong Coulomb interactions determines, you know, decides that it's energetically favorable to spontaneously polarize and occupy with the electrons, all of the electrons to one flavor and empty the other three. So one of the flavors gets fully occupied, okay? While the other three empty, okay? And then you start all over again. You start to fill these three flavors, okay? The three remaining flavors. When you are close to total filling factor two, meaning these three flavors one third occupied, now one of the flavors again spontaneously polarized gets polarized, the other two flavors get empty, and you repeat this thing, okay? This simple picture where due to Coulomb interaction, the system spontaneously flavor polarizes, okay, is able in a simple model to describe this sort of behavior of the inverse compressibility, okay? It's not exact and we are now, you know, theories are finding, you know, more refined models to, to, to think of this, but this is a picture that you can have in mind, okay? So we call this a cascade of phase transitions, okay? Because you have a series of phase transitions near each integer, okay? So this will appear a little bit later in my talk. Remember this cascade of phase transitions where you get a reset of your populations, okay? Now, more things that have happened is that, you know, the community has found out ferromagnetism, anomalous Hall effect, and the quantum anomalous Hall effect of physics in these systems, which brings the role of topology front and center in this more quantum matter, okay? So in fact, this more quantum matter field has meant the merging of several modern condensed matter communities, okay? Which did not interact that closely before. One is the two D van der Waals materials and heterostructure community, people that did the thing like myself. The other one is the more traditional strongly correlated materials, people that studied cuprates, nictites, et cetera. And then the people that study topological condensed matter physics, quantum hole effect, fractional quantum hole, topological insulators, et cetera. All three of these come together in this field of more quantum matter. And that's why this field you know, is, is, is flourishing. And it's, you know, so many people are interested because there are many, many things you know, for, for everyone to investigate. Now, let me tell you about what I call the next generation more quantum matter. Okay, So everything that I told you before was combinations of two layers. Okay, Now, published. Uh, last month, actually uh, by now, a couple of months ago, okay, were two papers, one by my group in Nature and the same week, one by my postdoc advisor, Philip Kim in Science, where we both, you know, introduced, you know, discovered that there is a new system called Magic Angle Twisted Trilayer Graphene, where now it's three layers twisted with different, you know, with twist angles, okay? And this is a much, much more interesting you know, system even than the bilayer graphene, okay? It realizes strongly coupled superconductivity and is the second robust Moray superconductor that in, in a more quantum matter family. So what, you know, what is exactly the system? So the system is mirror symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. Now that's a mouthful, okay? So let me show you the actual structure, okay? So what we have is three layers of graphene, okay? Where, if you start with the first you know, bottom layer, what you do is you add another layer by rotating an angle minus theta, and then you add a layer on top by rotating an angle theta with respect to the middle one. That means that the bottom and the top layers are actually exactly aligned. Okay? They're parallel to each other, okay? And not only parallel, they're you know, with zero twist angle, but also they are exactly aligned, all of the carbon atoms. Okay? This is a configuration that was first proposed by Eslam Halaf in the group of Ashwin Vishwanath at Harvard. Okay? And it's called A twisted A stacking. So all of the carbon atoms in bottom layer are underneath the carbon atoms in the top layer. And the middle one is twisted. Okay? Now, there have been a lot of related work on mirror symmetric magic and twisted trilayer graphene, related work on twisted trilayer multilayer systems, and, and you know, a lot of things. Okay. Now, this system is a very interesting because you know, if you think again of this trilayer system where you have interlayer tunneling T between each 
pair of layers, okay? It turns out this tri-layer system has a Hamiltonian, okay? Where you can now do a basis transformation, okay? A rotation of your basis and it becomes block diagonal, okay? Where one of the blocks is a magic angle twisted bilayer graphene-like block, but with a square root of two times tunneling. And the other block becomes a monolayer graphene-like, okay? So, this means now the following, because as I told you in, in the introduction, the interlayer tunneling determines the magic, you know, the condition, the flat band condition, okay, the magic angle. For magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, the magic angle is square root of two, because of this square root of two, times the magic angle twisted bilayer graphene angle, okay? So it's 1.1 times square root of two, which is 1.56 degrees, okay? Now, this means that the Moiré wavelength, instead of being 13 nanometers, like in the bilayer case, is a bit shorter because the angle is a bit larger. The Moiré wavelength is a bit shorter. It's nine nanometers now, okay? Now, the system has the following electronic structure, okay? Again, because your Hamiltonian can be decomposed block diagonal into magic angle bilayer-like and a monolayer-like you know, blocks. Now you have two you know, separate, you know, electronic structures coexisting in the same system, okay? You have in orange here, magic angle bilayer graphene like flat bands. And then in purple, you have a massless Dirac dispersion, just the same as graphene, okay? This is the electronic structure in this mirror symmetric configuration, okay? Now, at zero displacement field, what do I mean? Turns out in our structures, we have a bottom metallic electrode and a top metallic electrode, okay? So the, the, we have the magic angle trilayer graphene in the middle with we contact, you know, in a whole bar geometry so that we can pass a current and measure voltage and a whole voltage. And then we have this bottom electrode and these top electrodes. These are gates, electrostatic gates. And with these, we can change independently the charge density in the system if we, let's say, bias them to the, with the same polarity, with the same voltage, both gates. But if we apply opposite voltage to these gates, we apply a transverse electric field, transverse to the trilayer graphene, okay, in the system. So we can tune independently the transverse electric displacement field and the charge density of filling factor, okay? Now, when we apply a transverse electric field, now the bottom and the top layer are no longer equivalent. They are a different potential, okay? So we break the mirror symmetry. That breaking of mirror symmetry leads to a hybridization between the flat bands and the massless bands, okay? And the electronic structure is shown here. When you apply a finite displacement field, you can see that, you know, this node here is lifted up in energy and this thing is tunable with displacement field that we control electrically, okay? So this system, magic angle twisted trolley graphene, has a much more tunable electronic structure than the bilayer case. So now, the first thing that I want to show you is that this system is a robust superconductor, okay? So for that, you want to see zero resistance. Indeed, you measure the resistivity versus temperature, you reach zero. You can fit this with the famous Halperin-Nelson formula to extract a Beresovsky costly thoughtless transition temperature, which happens to be about 2.3 Kelvin in this case. You know, sometimes we quote in, in the community, the critical temperature at 50% normal cell resistance, that's about 2.9 Kelvin. Okay. Now, you also want to see flat voltage current characteristics. You want to make sure that that zero resistance is over an extended region. So there's no dissipation when you run a finite current. And indeed, you know, if you run a finite current, you have zero voltage drop until you abruptly switch, okay? You can do this then as a function of temperature. And you can analyze this data to extract, again, a TVKT, which is very similar to this one. Now, magic angle trilayer graphene is a robust superconductor, which is electrically tunable too, okay? So if you measure the resistivity versus temperature as a function of filling factor, you can see that around two holes per motor unit cell, if you add extra holes, you have the superconducting dome. If you add electrons, you have a smaller superconducting dome. We call this you know, filling factors minus two minus delta, meaning minus two minus a little bit, or minus two plus delta. 
we can go to the region of two electrons per mole unit cell, and you have another superconducting dome here and another superconducting dome when we do plus two minus delta, okay? Now, if we apply a magnetic field, you want to see superconductivity get suppressed, okay? So if you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, if you're at optimal doping, then, you know, if you measure your differential resistance versus current bias and perpendicular magnetic field, you can see that the critical current decreases with magnetic field, and then it has this long tail all the way to, you know, about half a Tesla. If you tune now your chemical potential, your density, to the edge of the superconducting dome, when the system is barely superconducting and therefore it breaks into superconducting islands connected by non-superconducting islands, okay, then you can measure Josephson phase coherence, these Fraunhofer-like oscillations, which tells you that the system exhibits Josephson phase coherence. So it is a superconductor, okay? So this fully establishes that this is a robust superconductor. And it's the second more a superconductor. Now, let me show you that this is a very highly tunable superconductor, okay? So if you measure, you know, we have now, again, as I mentioned, these two knobs, the density or filling factor and this electric displacement field, okay? Transverse to the system. So if we measure the resistivity versus filling factor, okay? Again, from minus four to plus four and displacement field, then we have this complex phase diagram. Okay, let me guide you through it. The light blue regions here are regions where there is superconductivity, okay? The highly resistive features are in yellow, okay? And as you can see, the system, you know, let me, let me now, you know, guide you a little bit. You know, the system has, this phase diagram has a certain degree of symmetry, okay? The first of, you know, first most noticeable is the symmetry between the top half and the bottom half, okay? So, positive and negative displacement field, you can see that the system is quite symmetric, okay? There is superconductivity mostly between filling factors minus two and minus three, okay? But at high displacement fields, you also have superconductivity between minus one and two and one and two, okay? Minus one and minus two and one and two, okay? Now, there is also a certain degree of symmetry left and right, okay? With respect to the charge neutrality point. But here, it's a bit more, you know, there is some symmetry, but it's also some asymmetry, depending how you want to look at it, okay? On one hand, there is indeed this asymmetry between this and this, okay? But on the other hand, superconductivity is stronger here. The resistive features are most pronounced on this side than on this side, okay? This is actually reminiscent of magic angle by Lady Graphene. It also exhibits, you know, overall electron hole asymmetry, you know, with respect to charge neutrality. Now, because the system, you know, this phase diagram is quite complex, Something we can do is, you know, not just measure the resistivity, but measure other quantities as a function of filling factor and displacement field and see if they correlate with this phase diagram, okay? So what we decided to do is to measure the normalized hole density, okay? So what do I mean by that? This thing is called new H and it's four times the hole density divided by this super lattice density, the number of electrons holes you have to put per more unit cell to fill the bands, okay? So the whole density is telling you, you know, in the simplest case, it's telling you what are, what is the density of free carriers which are co contributing to transport, okay? So it's equal to one over the whole voltage in your system, yeah, proportional to one over the whole voltage in your system. So if we measure that, this normalized whole density, okay? Again, versus filling factor and displacement field, you have this, you know, relatively complex behavior, okay? So let me now uh, simplify this a little bit for you. Turns out most of the behavior that we see, okay, to see the order, all the regions that we see in the system, you know, all the behaviors that we can see can be attributed to one of the following three situations, okay? Situation number one is a gradual change smooth change of the whole voltage, you know, from negative to positive going smoothly through zero, okay? That behavior is associated with either a gap or a Dirac point, okay? So remember, your whole density is telling you what is the number of available, you know, 
uh, electrons you know, to conduct electricity. At a Dirac point, your Fermi energy crosses zero and you have zero charge carriers. So you go smoothly through zero, okay? Same thing happens at a gap, okay? So this is the behavior that occurs in different regions here. For example, let me highlight one at charge neutrality where we know we have Dirac points. There you can see that we go from dark blue to light blue, white, light red, darker red, okay? So this is this type of behavior, okay? Now, another type of behavior, we call it resets, where your hole density, your normalized hole density increases in an absolute value, then resets close to zero, and then it increases again, okay? But without changing sign. This can occur for electrons, as shown here, or in blue for holes. Let me show you one example here for holes, okay? You have here light blue, darker blue, then reset to white, okay, to zero, and then light blue and darker blue, okay? You can see here. Okay? So that is, these resets occur in regions where we have this cascade of phase transitions, okay? You remember I told you we have resets of their density, you know, at those cascade of phase transitions. This is very reminiscent of the situation in magic angle, by Lady Graphene. Okay. And then the last type of behavior, okay, is behavior where your normalized hole density has this behavior. You know, it, you know, it goes negative, diverges negative, then flips, sign diverges positive, and then decreases. Okay. So this is behavior that is associated with a von Hoff singularity. At a von Hoff singularity, your your hole voltage goes smoothly through zero, which means your normalized hole density, which is one over hole voltage, diverges and flip sign, okay? So this is a behavior that happens, for example, here. You can see this goes light blue, dark blue, then abruptly switches to dark red, and then light red, okay? So light blue, dark blue, abruptly switches dark red, light red, okay? So this behavior associated with the von Hoff singularity. Now, what we can do now is we can take these two diagrams, okay? And we can see if there's any correlation between these diagrams, okay? And because superimposing them would be a little bit too messy, let me do it schematically. So I'm showing here, I'm going to focus on the superconducting region boundaries, okay? So I have here regions of superconductivity versus displacement field and thinning factor, okay? So this blue, dark blue means robust, you know, strong superconductivity, light blue means weak, still present, but weak superconductivity, okay, with a small critical temperature. And now I'm going to superimpose the behaviors that we saw in the normalized hole density. So these red lines correspond to regions where we have gap Dirac behavior. This orange corresponds to resets. And the dark blue corresponds to Van Hoff singularity behavior, okay? And now you see that the pattern emerges, okay? At zero displacement field or at low displacement field, superconductivity is bounded between the resets happening at minus two, minus three, and two and three, for the most part. Okay? But then at high displacement field, superconducting regions are bounded by Van Hoff singularities, okay? And gap Dirac regions, okay? So let's look a little bit more closely at this behavior, okay? So in particular, let's look at the trace going through this point where we have a Van Hoff singularity and a superconducting boundary region here. Okay, so if we measure the resistivity versus density versus filling factor, okay, we can see that this is crossing, you know, resistivity is zero while the system is superconducting, and then it comes out of the superconducting state, finite resistance, okay. If we measure the critical temperature, the BKT, you know, critical temperature on the same plot, you know, on the same density trace, we see that, of course, it's finite in the superconducting state and then becomes zero as you get out of the superconducting state. Okay? Now, what we can measure now is the effective mass of our carriers along that density trace, okay? The effective mass is proportional to the density of states, okay? So we measure the effective mass by looking at the temperature dependence of the Shunikov de Haas oscillations, okay? And effective mass is plotted here versus density. As you can see, it diverges at this point, okay? This point happens to be the point where we cross that Van Hoff singularity, okay? So now you can see 
this is a very unusual behavior, very much unlike BCS type, okay? In the BCS theory of superconductivity, okay, your critical temperature, your superconducting critical temperature increases exponentially with increasing density of states. Here we have the opposite behavior. Not only it doesn't increase, it actually decreases with increasing density of states. And in fact, it becomes zero at the maximum density of states, yeah? So here, the function singularity is not the point where you have the strongest superconductivity, it's the point where superconductivity ends, okay? So that's very unusual. So let me show you, you know, it's definitely not weak coupling BCS type superconductivity, okay? What is realized in the system. So let me show you what, what you know, what, you know, more about this. So we can measure this, BKT temperature versus filling factor and displacement field, okay? So we can do this in this 3D plot, okay? Again, this system is very highly tunable. And then I'm going to project this into the top plane, yeah? Now, as I told you, the superconductivity has the highest critical temperature in this region, but also finite in this region, and then a different displacement fields here. Let me show you a trace of, you know, because it's quite complex, a trace of TBKT versus Elect, you know, versus the density at optimal displacement field and versus displacement field at optimal density. So you get a flavor of this behavior. So this is TBKT versus density at optimal displacement field. You see a small dome for electron doping. For hole doping, you have a much bigger dome. Now in the same diagram, we can measure the superconducting coherence length, okay? The ginzburg landau superconducting coherence length it exhibits this behavior. It turns out, you know, this is an extremely short superconducting coherence length, okay? So to give you an idea, let me plot here also, what is the average in the particle distance as a function of density here, okay? And as you can see, near optimal doping, the average in the particle, you know, the superconducting coherence length is of the same order as the average in the particle distance, okay? Now, in the weak coupling limit, the superconducting coherence length is interpreted as the coupe pair size, okay? You can do the following, the same thing as a function of displacement field, superconducting coherence length, the average interparticle distance at optimal density. So what we can see is that at optimal doping, the coupe pair size is of the same you know, order as the average interparticle distance, okay? Usually in, in conventional superconductors, your coupe pairs are much, much, much bigger, okay, than your average interparticle distance, but here are of the same order. So this reminds us of the situation that is realized in the BCS to BC crossover, something which is typically realized in the cold atoms community, okay? Where in you know, the cold atoms, you can go, you know, you have this knob called the flashback resonance, and then you can tune the scattering length. So you can go all the way from the BCS limit where your group preparers are much bigger than during the particle distance, all the way to the deep in the BC limit where your group preparers are tightly you know, bound, okay? And they're separate forming tightly bound molecules, much more spaced from each other, okay? And the region in between when your group preparer size is of the same order as the interparticle distance, that occurs at the BCS to BC crossover, okay? So in 3D, the critical temperature versus your Fermi temperature, is bounded by this thing called, by this number 0.22. In two dimensions, your BKT temperature over your Fermi temperature is bounded by 0.125, okay? Which is reached at the BC to BC, BCS, BCS to BC crossover, okay? So we can measure the Fermi temperature in our system because we have the effective mass and the density. We can measure this as a function of displacement field. We also have the TBKT temperatures. So we can plot TBKT over TF versus filling factor. We can do the same thing versus displacement fill. And as you can see, this is actually 0.125, the dashed line. So TBKT reaches values in excess of 0.1 with the maximum actually coincided with 0.125, okay? Which tells you that the system is very close to the VCS, the VC crossover. Now, the strength of a superconductor is typically measured in this, uh, type of diagrams where you have the critical temperature in log scale versus the Fermi temperature in log scale, okay? Now, 
Conventional superconductors, BCS weak coupling superconductors are typically near this region, like aluminum, okay? This is the BC BCS crossover in three dimensions. This purple band, you know, the more you move towards this purple band, the more exotic your superconductors are, okay? This, here in particular in this purple band, you have the cuprates, the nictites, the organics, the heavy fermions. This is the, you know, BCS, BC crossover in two dimensions, okay? The magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, depending on whether you do BKT or 50% homocyte resistance, this is where those points lie in this diagram. Magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, those points are here, okay? This is the most strongly coupled superconductor that exists in the world, okay? Further, you know, if the cuprates had the coupling strength of magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, they would be room temperature superconductors, well above room temperature, okay? Now, recently another system, lithium doped zirconium nitrogen chloride has also been shown by the Gauss's group to be a strong coupling superconductor. Okay, so now in the last few minutes, let me tell you about an unexpected surprise. So I showed you data in a perpendicular magnetic field before, okay? When you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, you know, due to orbital effects, you form vortex, vortices in your system and your superconductivity disappears. It disappears well below one Tesla. Right? Now, because magic angle to citrate graphene is a two-dimensional superconductor, you can also apply in-plane field. Now, this in-plane field does not create vortices. You would need hundreds of Tesla for that, okay, because it's two-dimensional. So then we can look at what happens under when you apply a, a Zeeman field, okay? Just affecting the spin of the system. And now in conventional superconductors, you have something called the Pauli limit. What is this? So conventional Cooper superconductors have spin singlet Cooper pairs. This is an entangled state of two electrons. The binding energy for Cooper pairs is given by this formula. The gap is 1.76 times KVTC, okay? And then if you apply a Zeeman field, the Zeeman, field splits your spin up, spin down Cooper pairs, okay? So by the time the Zeeman energy, which is GMUBB, is of the same order as your gap, then superconductivity should have disappeared, okay? So this is something which leads to what's known as the Pauli limit, paramagnetic limit, or Chandrasekhar Clarkson limit, okay? Which this Pauli limit is 1.86 Tesla per Kelvin times critical temperature. So if you have a critical temperature of one Kelvin, your maximum field for which you expect to see any trace of superconductivity is 1.86 Tesla. And this is again for spin singlet superconductor, BCS spin singlet superconductors. So we take our magic angle graphene sample, we now warm it up, cool it down again in a parallel magnetic field configuration. Then we repeat the measurements at zero field. We have the same, you know, very similar data as before. The TC, okay, it's about 2.7 Kelvin at optimal doping and electric field. That means the power limit is five Tesla. By the time we reach five Tesla, so we can be completely gone, okay? We measure this sample at a parallel field of 10 Tesla, and we see that superconductivity is still very much present in a region of density and displacement field, okay? So we can do this actually you know, you can look at the critical current. You can see that as a function of parallel field, the critical current decreases, but still very much finite at 10 Tesla, okay? We can do measure these measurements of the resistivity as a function of density and displacement field zooming in in the region around two holes per mole in itself and very much present superconductivity at 10 Tesla, okay? Now, in order to extract the Pauli violation ratio, we have to take temperature dependence. So I'm, I'm gonna be showing you different cuts on a five dimensional plot, you know, parameter space, okay? So here is resistivity versus density and temperature at optimal electric field. And you can see that this is a standard superconducting dome, but now at different parallel magnetic fields. And you can see a 10 Tesla is still very much finite, okay? So now let me take a particular density near optimal doping, okay? And vary continuously the parallel magnetic field, resistivity versus temperature and parallel magnetic field at this filling factor, okay? You can see this sort of parabolic behavior, okay? You can take now any threshold you want for resistivity, 10% of the normal state resistance, 20%, 30%. This behavior is the same. It's also the same for BKT or 50%. These are parabolas, okay? And 
based on these parabolas, okay, you can calculate, you know, given what the TC is, you can calculate what should be the Pauli limit. And you can see the Pauli limits here for the different thresholds. As you can see, the system is superconducting up to much, much, much higher values, okay? In fact, the Pauli violation ratio at this filling factor is greater than three, okay? So now the different mechanisms for Pauli violation ratio superconductors, okay? You can have thin, strong spin of coupling that happens, for example, in niobium selenide, the monolayer. You have a huge Pauli violation ratio due to very strong spin of coupling. However, graphene has an extremely small spin of coupling. So this is very unlikely the spin of coupling is responsible for this, unless somehow spin of coupling is 30 times larger than, than in graphene for magic and twisted trilayer graphene, which is highly unexpected. You can also have something called finite momentum pairing, FFLO states, that can give you an enhancement of 20, 40% at very low temperatures. But again, we see a 300%, not a 20%. Variation and the violation is actually already starting from TC, not just at low temperatures, but it's starting all the way from TC. This very high poly violation. Okay, so again, this is very unlikely. And the last mechanism is that we could have preformed pairs, a pseudo gap, preformed pairs, so that your TC is not really related to your gap, and therefore you could have an apparent violation of the poly violation if you look at TC. However, you know, so this could happen because our system realizes strong coupling superconductivity. However, we can vary this TVKT over TF over more than an order of magnitude and reach the weak coupling regime. And still, even at those weak in this weak coupling regime, we see a large poly violation ratio. Okay. So this is again quite unlikely. Okay. That this is an explanation. Moreover, none of these can explain the following thing. I show you data at optimal electric field, but if you now look at smaller displacement fields, okay, what we find is that we have re-entrant superconductivity. Okay? I'm focusing now in the region only at high fields, but you see that your BKT transition okay, goes to zero as a function of parallel magnetic field, and then superconductivity re-emerges at higher magnetic field. Okay? That's extremely unlikely and cannot be explained by any of the other mechanisms. Okay? We can do this not only in you know, versus temperature, we see this behavior also versus in the critical current, okay? This re-entrant behavior, okay? Now this type of behavior, so we have this superconducting one superconducting two regions, something which occurs extremely rarely in condensed matter physics, okay? There's a family, you know, of radioactive compounds, you know, uranium family of compounds where you can have this re-entrant superconductivity Okay, which happens at high fields. Typically, this occurs in either ferromagnetic superconductors or nearly ferromagnetic spin triplet superconductors such as uranium Te2, where there is a field induced, a field induced transition to superconducting state. We have this type of field induced transitions to superconducting states, you know, here versus density and versus displacement field. So we believe that the system very likely realizes spin triplet superconductivity. Uh, certainly non-spin singlet superconductivity. Okay, so now in the last minute, because I know I'm running out of time, let me just tell you very briefly some of the outlook. So this is the summary of the trilayer work. I'm not gonna go through it. It's a very rich system. And we have you know, now a recipe to create more magic 4.0, 5.0, et cetera. Okay, I hope to be telling you about this in a, you know, in a few months and a few years. I have shown you that we can make Quite a bit of magic, you know, correlated insulators, superconductivity, topological phases, magnetism, nematicity, ferroelectricity. In fact, even though I haven't told you, in you know, using you know, doing more like quantum matter by using very simple building blocks: graphene, transition metal like calcogenides, and hexagonal boron nitride. Imagine the infinite more quantum matter possibilities when you start now twisting more complicated building blocks like superconductors, high tensile cuprates, which are 2D, ferroelectrics, quantum spin liquids and uh, uh, you know, magnets. In fact, theory is already predicting very interesting behavior, okay? For example, if you know, the group of Marcel Franz has predicted that if you twist two monolayer cuprate superconductors, okay, you will have a phase transition from a standard D wave superconductivity to a topological D plus ID topological superconductivity. So you have a topological phase transition. 
the group of Leon Valens has a series of papers predicting that you can have more M magnets by twisting two dimensional crystalline magnets. You know, there are many, many, you know, infinite amount of possibilities. Theories are exploring them all, and experimentalists, you know, will catch up you know, hopefully slowly. So, moreover, this thing, you know, this electronics happens also beyond quantum, you know, quantum materials, okay? People are already predicting what happens when you form moire and twisted cold atom lattices. You can do this with phonons or with classical mechanical systems also, even experiments have been realized already. You can make magic angle bilayer phononic graphene, okay? You can also do this with photonic systems, okay? So that you can slow light almost completely by forming a twisted, you know, amore photonic systems, etc. So with this, I wanna end by acknowledging my group members and collaborators, okay? Particularly Juan Sao and Jane Park, who were mostly responsible for the three layer work and also Daniel Rodan for uh, contributions to the bilayer. Collaborators at many institutions and funding. And I hope we can soon get back together to these type of events. And I wanna thank you all for your attention. Okay, Pablo, thanks. Thanks a lot for, for your great talk. Uh, I'm now going to be um, uh, reading the questions that uh, are already present in the in the chat, and let me let me take the opportunity to ask uh, uh, everyone who wants to ask a question to go to the Q and A um, link in the in the bottom uh, in the bottom right uh, icon in your screen, okay? And especially, I want to encourage the PhD students because these uh, are uh, lectures uh, intended to to them. And actually, see how Paulo was uh, trying to adapt uh, the, the level of the talk to them. So I'm very happy to uh, about that. So let me actually start with a question from from um, a PhD student from Daniel Brito. Um, uh, he's asking. Uh, he's saying, uh, "Hi, very good work and very interesting science uh, with promising properties." I just have uh, some questions that I didn't completely understood. Uh, in a uh, in a more matter, we need to have a twisting angle between the two layers. Experimentally, how is this possible? To twist those layers, and how precise is it possible to twist them, since the angle values are very small? Mm -hmm. Very good. Let me see if I have here a one of my backup slides that shows the the fabrication of the samples. Yes, here. So let me show you how we fabricate these samples. Okay. So you can, you know, you can think of. The, you know, this is schematically, by now actually we have refined this process, but schematically, you know, topologically is equivalent to this, you know. So let's, you know, we start by uh, taking a glass slide with a transparent polymer stack, sticky polymer here. Yeah? And then we bring a substrate which has hexagonal boron nitride, hexagonal boron nitride, you know, maybe 10 nanometer thick flake. This is an ultra flat substrate where graphene likes to sit, okay? We pick up this hexagonal laboronite with a sticky polymer. Then we bring <coughs> another substrate which has graphene on it. And we align our hexagonal laboronite sort of halfway on top of this graphene flake so that we can go down and tear this graphene flake in two pieces. Okay. So from the top, now we have the glass light with the hexagonal boron nitride and half of the graphene. And the other half of the graphene is on the substrate. Now, because these two pieces come from the exact same graphene flake, they are crystallographically aligned, just at different heights. Okay. So now what we can do is we can rotate the substrate by any angle that we want. For example, 1.1 degrees, why not? Okay. And then we can shift the substrate, yeah? and then we can stack this graphic sheet on top of the other and we retrieve it and this more pattern is formed and these two graphene sheets have been you know, formed at that angle, okay? And then we continue doing nano fabrication. The rest of the process is pretty standard. Yeah? So this is something that amazingly gives you, you know, this very periodic you know, more pattern, you know, which allows us to investigate this system, okay? So it is, you know, it is at the same time as simple as it looks here and quite a bit more difficult to do it, okay? Um, now, there are you know, many, you know, dozens of groups that can do this around the world. And in fact, if COVID had not happened, 
we would have organized, I'm still planning to do this, but you know, maybe next summer, uh, I mean, 2022, a workshop, you know, uh, you know, workshop where we will demonstrate these things in several labs around the world so that everybody can do this because it's really not that difficult. It's not simple, but it's not that difficult, okay? Just with a little bit of effort, you can actually do this. Uh, thanks, Pablo. So uh, if you are going to be touring around the world to show how to do this, I hope you can visit INL next uh, on Sunday. Oh, no, no, no. We, we, will, we will invite students to come to a few labs around the world to, to see this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you or, or, or someone of your group. Okay, so let me let me keep reading questions here. Um, okay, um, this one is by Himanshu Dev. The question is the following. What is the meaning of negative inverse compress compressibility in electron filling? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Okay, so let me let me go to that slide. Where is this? Yeah, negative com yeah negative inverse compressibility indeed as it's in this region. Okay, tells you the system you know the chemical potential goes down as you add charge to your system. Okay, which you may think like, oh, this is crazy. How can this be? Well, let me give you an analogy. How can you think about this? You know, imagine you have a bottle of water. Okay, you can think of the chemical potential as the level of water as you add water to it, and charge density as the water as you add to it, right? In a rigid bottle of water, as you add water to the bottle, the level rises. Simple. Okay, now imagine you have a fluffy bottle of water. It can happen that you add water to the bottle, the level is rising, but at some point it deforms. And even though you are adding water, the level goes down, okay? That's kind of an analogy with how this thing can happen in a condensed matter system. So negative compressibility has been seen before in different systems, okay? Negative inverse compressibility. It happens often in the case of very strong electron electron interactions where you can have rearrangements of your, you know, uh, many body physics, okay? It happens typically in the fractional quantum hole regime, okay? And sometimes also in the integer quantum hole regime. And it is seen in the system also where, you know, in these regions where the integers, where interactions play a strong role in this cascade of phase transitions, okay? So the microscopics for how exactly this happens is, you know, is, is, is you know, one has to do theory about it and it's not fully understood yet exactly how it happens, but it's something that simple models can give you already uh, when you include strong interactions. It happens also in bignet crystals, for example, okay? In strong interacting systems. Okay, thanks. One more question. This is coming from Pedro Cruz, a PhD student in, in my group. Uh, he says, there is a lot of interest today in using quantum hardware from foundation understand high TC superconductivity. Much of the work regards uh, finding static and equilibrium properties at the ground and low energy states. However, how could we use simulations to understand how to knob the Hubbard model parameters uh, in order to increase the critical temperature for, super, for superconductivity, for instance? So you, 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 you were chopping <laughs> here and there, so I hope I got <laughs> the basics of the question. I think you're asking, uh, um, uh, you know, is, is this system about how to use this system perhaps to understand you know, high temperature conductivity or in general more um, quantum simulators or can, can you maybe- Actually, actually uh, let's, go with, let's go with that, okay? I think the, the I'm trying to interpret the question of Pedro uh, and, and maybe that's the, the, the good question to ask, right? Is how to use twisted uh, uh, more to, um, uh, to do quantum simulation, right? This has a review yeah. with this title. So, so what I, about that? So I, so I think that you know, you know, one one you know initially, and I mean to this day is still a, a strong motivation. But initially, you know, a, a large uh, motivation to you know to have these highly tunable you know more systems was you know let's see you know your know, high temperature cooper superconductors you know are, are you know complicated materials and there's a lot of chemical disorder and etc. Graphene on top of graphene, you know, graphene is, has been studied to death, you know, it's a super simple system, at least conceptually, you know. So what can be simpler than graphene on graphene, right? The, the idea is if we can try to understand what is the essence of strongly correlated physics, you know, how does superconductivity appear in a strongly correlated physics by investigating this system, you know, maybe if we can understand the essence, 
of how superconductivity arises out of strong interactions in the system. Perhaps that can teach us lessons to design at atomic scales other superconductors which have that same essence. But if you do it at atomic scales, then you would be able to have critical temperatures if, if the same coupling strength is maintained at room temperature or above, OK? So that was part of the motivation. Um, I think that in that sense, indeed, there's more systems because we have many more tuning knobs. For example, now in this tri-layer, you know, we have two knobs, you know, so we can constrain a lot, you know, the theory on you know, what the theory has to predict and tell us in order for the system to be super, uh, to explain superconductivity. In that sense, having many more knobs, that is a, a little bit of a similar situation to the cold atoms community, though, where they control perfectly their lattices, okay? We don't have quite perfect control as they have, but we have a lot more control than in a standard condensed matter system. And the idea is that let's just vary more the parameters so that we can strain better the theory. We can understand perhaps the essence of uh, the superconductivity in the systems. Now, since then, I have talked to a lot of people in, and also yeah, realized myself that the system is actually far richer because of the topological properties, because of the topology involved. So I no longer, you know, it's, it's great and a great motivation to try to understand the essence of, you know, correlated physics and superconductivity and perhaps to get to room temperature for conductors. But I think in its own right, just for the fun of itself, because it's intellectually very interesting, merging topology and correlations and all the fascinating, you know, now theories have a concrete platform where to think of for what are the topological phases of strongly interacting systems, which before was something very abstract, you know, without a particular platform to think of. So I think that, you know, just the system in itself is a lot of fun. And, you know, if we understand all areas to design room temperature superconductors, it would be, of course, great. But if not, the system is just a lot of fun. Let's just explore it by itself. You know. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And this is so much fun that maybe it's better to focus on this one. <laughs> Cooper, it's, uh are uh, maybe all the stuff. So Pablo, um, do you have more time to have uh, like a no? two yeah, 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 please, yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, okay, great. So there is a follow-up question uh, for, uh, on, on the compressibility. This is by a different uh, person, uh, Mar Mauricio Quintela. He's asking, uh, okay, so let me read it. Uh, following from the question of the negative inverse compressibility and regarding the relation that you mentioned between the inverse compressibility and the inverse of the density of the states, what would be a negative, uh, what would negative inverse compressibility uh, imply in terms of the density of states? So I guess the, the, he yeah. wants to know if there is a negative density of states, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but no. So, yeah. you know, the compressibility, I told you, in a single particle picture, the compressibility is just proportional to the density of states. When you include many body, then it's not just the density of states, okay? It's a more complicated relation with the density of states. And in particular, also, this you know, this you know, inverse compressibility, you have to think of this in the context, you know, of the entire system, including, you know, your gate electrodes, et cetera. You know, it's not, you know, this doesn't violate any law of thermodynamics or anything like that, okay? Once you include all elements that are contributing to this, okay? You don't have just the magic angle graphene, you have also a metallic plate, which is the other plate of the capacitor with which you are inducing charge in the system. So when you look at the thermodynamic compressibility of the entire system, you know, you don't violate anything, okay? So you don't have to think of um, negative density of states, you just have to think of, or oh, in a system with a, typically it's a system with a low, you know, density of states, you know, or, 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 or that and or strong interactions, okay? When now adding electrons to your system starts rearranging electrons like in, you know, Wigner crystals or, you know, the many body ground state can change, etc. In that context, is it, you know, Again, the best analogy that I have is this bottle of water that can get deformed, you know, if you add a lot of water and your Fermi level, you know, your water level can go down even though you're adding water, okay? That's sort of the best picture I have, I think, for to understand this, you know. Okay, thanks. Now, I have a couple of questions for more veteran students. Uh, one is uh, Ivan Bruega, and, and, and I will leave the uh, uh, Stefan question for, for the end. So let me start with the question of you, uh, Ivan. So uh, how critical is the AA stacking between the top and the bottom graphene layers in the tri-layer system? And how can you control that this AA stacking exists experimentally? 
Very good. I have a backup slide to answer that. Okay. Uh -huh. So let me let me just tell you. Um, let me well, actually, I can just use the backup slide. So the theoretical prediction for this mirror symmetric and, and all this thing was for actually a twisted a stacking. So indeed, you may wonder like, okay. Let's imagine we're very precise and very good with the angle. I think it's not too hard to believe that they may be parallel, the bottom and the top layer, but come on, exactly a line on top of each other. How do you get that? Okay. Well, so thankfully, sorry, I do have actually, I have to go to this slide. Thankfully, mother nature has been very kind with us because in this paper by the Caxidas group, they predicted all the configurations for this bottom and top layer parallel with the middle rotated. And it turns out the minimum energy configuration is the A twisted A stacking. So the system will want to have the top and bottom layers exactly on top of each other. That's the minimum configuration. There's another, the next minimum in the configuration with respect to lateral displacement, okay, is the A twisted B stacking, but it's at a higher energy, but it also corresponds to a minimum. So now the A twisted A and the A twisted B stacking have actually different electronic structure, okay? So we can actually do experiments to measure the electronic structure of our system. And we see that ours is the A twisted A stacking one, okay? So at zero displacement field, you have this massless direct band and the flat bands. If you measure the, you know, and this plot here, I'm showing the derivative of the whole resistance versus magnetic field, okay? Versus uh, uh, the derivative of the whole magnetic versus, of the whole signal versus magnetic field as a function of perpendicular magnetic field and filling factor. You can see that there is a vertical feature appearing at each integer, okay? Those are from the flat bands. And then you have this parabola, parabolic-like feature, okay? It turns out these are the Landau levels of the monolayer band. We are sensing them Okay, we're sensing them in this special configuration, you know. Um, in fact, you can see here, this is the negative compressibility. This is the, you're measuring here the chemical potential of the Landau levels in the bilayer band, okay? And if we actually sit at four, when this flat band has been occupied and we're only crossing the massless band and you measured your whole conductance, you can see, 2, 6, 10, you know, e square over H, 14 e square over H, which is the quantum whole sequence of a massless Dirac fermions, okay? So we can see that we have indeed at zero displacement field, this massless Dirac band and this flat band. At finite displacement field, we do not see the massless band because now we have gotten rid of it, okay? So that's how we know that we have the A twisted A stacking configuration in our sample, which is the energetically most favorable anyway. Okay, good. So let me let me ask you now a question by by Stefan Stefan Roche. Uh, so great talk, Pablo. Uh, do your samples will exhibit fractional quantum hole effect for magnetic angle and strong magnetic field? The question would be to test the validity of the anion fractional statistics, also for the anomalous supraconducting state as originally proposed for the high TC, and disregarded. Anions would be related to some internal flux that could be detected by evaluation of time reversal and parity. Mm -hmm. So we, we have not seen fractional quantum hole effect um, in magic angle bilayography. No one has seen that. Okay. Um, it's something that people are looking for. And I think it will be probably soon det be detected. Okay. That's all I can say for now. <laughs> wow, that sounds uh, very exciting as well. Okay, Pablo, um, I don't see more questions around. So let me, let me thank you for, for your great talk. And uh, it has been really great. This is all very exciting and very interesting and, and very overwhelming also. I mean, you have the impression that this is uh, it's a huge area of research and, and, and and we are very happy that uh, you are telling us about it. Okay, so thank thanks a lot for for being in our uh, QPI lectures. Uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna call it a day now.
well, you're going to start your day now, but for me, I'm going to call it a day. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for your presence here today. Uh, and don't forget that uh, we will be here in another two weeks with a new Quantum uh, Portugal Initiative uh, lecture. Thank you so much. Have a nice um, afternoon. Um, see you then. Bye.